Okay, well, I think we've reached the magic hour to get going. Thank you all very much for coming. I must say you're better dressed than most of the audiences I address in the university. Thank you very much for that. Um, tonight, of course, we are fortunate to have Henry Lytton as our guest speaker. He's giving tonight one of two lectures in the Cutting Edge of the Law series, and the first one today will deal with the uh, abuse, or sorry, the use and misuse of judicial review. And I think on this topic, Henry will be speaking for about six and a half hours. So if any of you, you know, have brought your pajamas, that's a good thing. I, I should think there'll be uh, <laughs> a lot to talk about on that topic. And then the second lecture uh, will include, at the end of it, the award of the Blue Bell Prize, which Henry has set up um, to uh, improve, or at least to assist young people in learning how to write a concise and clear judgment. And uh, Henry's doing it through Hong Kong U, and we're very proud to be associated with him. And the award, the prize winner, will be announced at the second lecture. But very briefly, Henry's asked me only to give a brief introduction. Um, very briefly, Henry studies at DBS, and then in England, he went to Merton, Oxford, um, and uh, was called to the bar in England in 1959, and he was appointed, came to Hong Kong to practice, appointed senior counsel in 1970. And uh, in, in his spare time, Henry was involved in founding the Hong Kong Law Journal, which of course is extremely close to our hearts at Hong Kong U. It's blossomed and he was chairman of the Hong Kong Law Journal for 21 years. And that was, thank you so much, Henry. I think it has borne an enormous amount of fruit and continues to do so. Thank you. Um, turning back to, to Henry's uh, career in law, um, he was... Uh, uh, appointed uh, to the to the bench, and then uh, uh, to the Court of uh, Appeal in 1992, and appointed a permanent judge of the Court of Final Appeal in 1997. And he served on the CFA from 97 until very recently. Uh, as you will well know, this is going off my script. Um, Henry participated in almost every leading conveyancing judgment. Malcolm Mary hosted a lunchtime seminar earlier this week and Malcolm was more, uh, did better research than I have and he listed all the leading judgments that Henry had been involved in and they are quite spectacular, quite remarkable. And, and as a teacher who mentions Henry in almost every lecture I ever give, occasionally agreeing with you as well, um, I must say that, that Henry has, has given so much to Hong Kong jurisprudence. Uh, so, Henry, on behalf of the entire legal system of Hong Kong, <laughs> <laughs> judiciary, government, you know, everything. Chief Executive asked me to say this personally. I, uh, we, we very, very much appreciate what you've left us, and we hope you will continue to give us more perhaps now through the academic voice as opposed to the judicial voice. Um, I should also uh, mention that Henry's contribution to the uh, Faculty of Law at Hong Kong U was not confined to the Hong Kong Law Journal. It has been much wider. He was chairman of the Advisory Committee on Legal Education for many years, which oversaw legal education. I attended many meetings under his chairmanship. I was always scared of him. You perhaps remember. Um, also at Hong Kong U, he's played a very vital role in the development of the faculty. And two years ago, he was appointed an honorary professor, and he's not taking that appointment uh, as a nominal appointment. He's giving a lot to us in return. Finally, Henry, your most important achievement you just won't believe as a hiker how far he can walk. 
He nearly killed me 12 months ago. And in fact, I have proof. <laughs> Ever since hiking with Henry on that occasion, I've been limping. I hope to recover eventually. And if you invite me this time, Henry, I'm busy. <laughs> so over to you, please. The use and misuse of judicial review. Oh, I should say, sorry. Tell them how long you're going to speak. I missed that out. Um, the proposal is that I should speak, or rather I'm commanded to only speak for 45 minutes, at the end of which there will be time for questions and answers of about 15 to 20 minutes thereafter. Right, well, here we go. <clears throat> Judicial review. I start with the statutory framework. And uh, in dealing with a subject like judicial review, it's not a bad thing to go back <coughs> to source. Now, Section 21K of the High Court Ordinance is the statutory framework subsection 1 deals with applications to the court of first instance for orders of mandamus, prohibition and certiorari <clears throat> subsection 2 deals with applications for a declaration and an injunction each of these remedies come within the scope of judicial review the discipline of law is concerned with remedies. There is no wrong without a right, as the saying goes. I therefore make no apology for looking at the procedures for relief. And first, have a look at the source of the court's jurisdiction. Now, Section 21K of the High Court Ordinance is not an empowering section it presupposes the existence of the remedies by way of certiorari, mandamus, prohibition, etc. Section 21K says that any application to the High Court for such relief must be made in accordance with rules by way of an application for judicial review. The source of power to grant such relief comes not from statute but from the inherent jurisdiction of the High Court, a court of unlimited jurisdiction, as contrasted with the Magistrates Court and the District Court, the contrast of some significance, as I shall enlarge upon later on. It is, if you like, a self-created jurisdiction as the common law evolved. And as the exercise of this jurisdiction intrudes into the administrative sphere of government, the courts were in the olden days very careful about its use. <clears throat> English law at one time, in the past, drew a line between what is judicial and what is administrative. If a public body was acting judicially or quasi-judicially, its conduct was subject to control by way of certiorari, mandamus, prohibition. But if it was acting administratively, the courts steered clear. You take the great case of Franklin against the Minister of Town and Country Planning, reported in 1948, decided shortly after the Second World War. The minister, under a very socialist government headed by Clement Attlee, had designated Stevenage as a new town, bringing in powers of compulsory purchase and so on. Local landowners objected. The House of Lords held that as the minister was acting administratively and had no quasi-judicial duties imposed upon him, the courts could not interfere. It is an aspect, if you like, of the separation of powers. 
But the distinction between acts purely administrative and quasi-judicial was very difficult to draw. Things started to shift in the 1960s in England, beginning with the great case of Padfield against the Minister of Agriculture, 1968 uh, appeal cases, where farmers in the southeast of England asked the minister to appoint a committee to investigate price differentials in the milk business. The Act of Parliament setting up a national milk marketing scheme had made express provisions for a committee to investigate complaints. The disgruntled farmers got an order of mandamus from Lord Parker, the Chief Justice in the Divisional Court, requiring the minister to appoint such a committee. But his decision was reversed by a majority in the Court of Appeal with Lord Henning dissenting. Now, for simplicity and clarity of reasoning, I would commend students to read Lord Denning's dissenting judgment in Hatfield against the Minister of Agriculture. In essence, it boils down to this. When the legislature had set up machinery for the very purpose of investigating complaints, the minister could not simply throw complaints into the waste paper basket. Now, this is not my phrase, this is Lord Denning's. The statute itself did not permit the minister to refuse to have a seemingly genuine complaint investigated by the committee without good reason. The fact that the minister's decision was administrative and not quasi-judicial was not the end of the story. In the House of Lords, the judgments of Lord Parker and Lord Denning were upheld. Now, I go a little more deeply now into Order 53 of the rules of the High Court. Subsection 3 of Section 21K of the High Court Ordinance says that no application for judicial review shall be made unless leave of the court first instance has been obtained in accordance with rules of court. And the court shall not give leave unless the applicant has sufficient interest in the matter. <clears throat> Order 53 provides the procedure for applications. It is a two-step process. First, you make an application to a judge ex parte for leave. If leave is granted, you then take out an originating summons under Order 53, Rule 5, using Form 86A, I emphasize that, which must then be served on, quotes, all persons directly affected, unquotes. It is only with the originating summons that proceedings for judicial review begin. And I deal now a bit more with the first step, which is the ex parte application. This is a very important stage intended to screen out hopeless cases. An applicant refused leave has a right of appeal to the Court of Appeal, Order 53, Rule 3, Sub Rule 4. The origin of this first step goes right back to the times of the old prerogative writs under English law, say the writ of um, mandamus or writ of certiorari. It is the means by which the monarch, the king, acting through his courts, exerted control over inferior tribunals and public bodies throughout his kingdom. The individual petitions the king for his assistance, and if the petition is granted, it is the king himself who brings the proceedings on behalf of the individual. Hence, the title, for instance, of the fairly recent case in England, the Queen versus the Home Secretary, ex parte blind. You, some of you may have read that case. It was uh, reported in 1991. 
a few cases, where a journalist challenged the Home Secretary's directive to the BBC prohibiting the broadcasting of speeches by representatives of, of proscribed terrorist organizations. The prescribed form in our statute to use uh, to use in making the application for leave is Form 86. At this stage, there is no need to name all parties affected, a point which is relevant when I come to deal later on with the case of TVB against the Communications Authority. Now, paragraph 53, stroke 14, stroke 2 of the Hong Kong White Book 2016 says that an application for leave will normally be dealt with by the judge in charge of the administrative and constitutional law list without a hearing. That can be done where the applicant has not asked for a hearing in his notice of application. <coughs> it would be appropriate at this point to note an error in paragraph 53 stroke 14, stroke 2, of the White Book, dealing with the application for leave. It says that the form to be used by the applicant is Form 86A. But this is only appropriate after leave has been given to be used with the originating summons. This error in the White Book may be symptomatic of an anomaly that has crept into the whole process of applications for judicial review of eliding the two stages into one. And I illustrate this by reference to a very recent case that you probably all are familiar with, the case of Kwok Chuk Kin against the chief executive of the Hong Kong SAR and the government of the Hong Kong SAR. It's um, HCAL 103 of 2014. The proposed re respondents, note well, were respectively one, the chief executive of the Hong Kong SAR, and two, the government of the Hong Kong SAR, an application for leave. The notion that the entire government of the Hong Kong SAR should be subject to review is totally absurd and is symptomatic of how far the system has been abused in recent times. One look at Mr. Kwok's ex parte application should have convinced the judge that the proposed relief sought against the chief executive was equally absurd. The background to Mr. Kwok's application you're probably familiar with, but let me remind you. In October 2013, the government had set up a task force to conduct public consultations regarding the method for selecting the chief executive in 2017 and for forming the Legislative Council in 2016. Following this, the chief executive reported on the 15th of July last year to the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress that there was a need to amend the method for selecting the chief executive in 2017. Now it is that report of the 15th of July 2014 which was the focus of Mr. Kwok's application for judicial review. Judicial review is concerned with illegality, abuse of power by public authorities, and so on. In essence, presumably, what Mr. Kwok was saying in his application was this, that the report made by the Chief Executive to the Standing Committee of the NPC was unlawful, was an abuse of his powers as Chief Executive. Now, how making a report could be an unlawful act is beyond imagination. 
a report is a report. It might be libelous. It might defame. Those affected might claim damages for tortious wrong. But the idea that the act of making a report by the head of government to the central government could be regarded as an unlawful act in Hong Kong public law is beyond imagination. Mr. Kwok's application was simply grandstanding, a misuse of the court process. The ex parte application should have been simply dismissed summarily under the rules. It should have been given no oxygen. Instead, counsel for the proposed respondents were brought in to discuss whether leave should be given to Mr. Kwok. At a hearing conducted in April this year, two months later, the judge gave what he called a judgment. I put that in quotes. Dismissing, of course, the application. The judgment, so-called, makes bizarre reading. Since the conclusion inevitably was that there was nothing to argue and that leave should be refused, how is it consistent with the outcome that there should be 30-odd paragraphs of discussion? The judge called it a judgment. It was not a judgment. A judgment decides issues between parties. What the judge had to determine was whether there were issues and he held that there was none. And yet he chose to call that document a judgment. It seems from paragraph 29 of the judgment that counsel had sought from the judge quotes, general guidance, unquotes, on the way public consultation should be conducted. It shows how far proper discipline has been leached out of this branch of the law. What possible guidance can judges give to the executive arm of government as to how the public should be consulted? And what on earth has this got to do with the remedy of certiorari? Has the courtroom become a senior common room where gentlemen sit cosily around the table sipping port, leisurely discussing points of law? Has the cutting edge of the law been blunted to this extent? At the end of his judgment, the judge said this, quotes, Finally, I would like to thank counsel for their assistance in this matter. Unquotes. Are these mere formulaic words, or did the judge really mean them? Was he really saying that, but for counsel's assistance, he might have given leave for the matter to proceed to judicial review. That would seem totally impossible. But what possible assistance then did counsel give other than participation in a purely theoretical exercise which led nowhere? <clears throat> now, I deal with the television broadcasts against communications authority and the Chief Executive and Council case, which is um, HCAL 3 stroke 2013. This is yet another ex parte application for leave to apply for judicial review, where again, counsel for the proposed respondents was heard, resulting in yet another lengthy so-called judgment. The judge concluded quite inevitably, given the circumstances revealed, that there was nothing in the application which could remotely entitle the applicant to relief. 
The background to the application goes back about six years. There were only two free-to-air TV stations in Hong Kong, the applicant, TVB, and ATV. The government had received applications from three other companies for the grant of free-to-air licenses, which, if acceded to, would oppose competition to the two existing TV stations. The Broadcasting Authority carried out consultations, engaged consultants to conduct competition analysis. Based on the results of the public consultation and the consultant's report, the authority submitted recommendations to the Chief Executive and Council suggesting that the applications by the three companies be approved in principle. This was in July 2011. Two years later, TVB took out the present ex parte application. It is not clear from the quotes unquote judgment what precise order the applicant sought. The most likely seems to be an order of prohibition prohibiting the chief executive and council from acting on the authority's recommendation. Now, TVB's complaints, as summarized by the judge, were these. Note them well. One, TVB had only been given redacted copies of the consultant's report. Two, there were errors in the report, particularly regarding revenue from TV advertising. Three, TVB was a major stakeholder in the free-to-air TV market and had not been properly consulted. The judgment identified no right or interest of the applicant which had been affected by the action of the authorities. The matters complained of, as summarized above, could not remotely have caused a court to intervene. And the judge so concluded. The judge, in his judgment, quoted with emphasis, was put into italics, a statement by Lord Justice Carnworth in the Queen against Secretary for Communities and Local Government ex parte Shrewsbury Borough Council, quotes, Judicial review generally is concerned with actions or other events which have or will have substantial legal consequences. For example, by conferring new legal rights or powers, or by restricting existing legal rights or interests. Recognizing this deficiency in TVB's application in the way set out in Lord Justice Canberth's judgment, the odd thing is that the judge did not simply dismiss the application summarily. Now, and note this, the applicant's complaint, if valid, directly concerned the interests of the three companies which wanted to obtain TV licenses. They were not parties to the proceedings, nor were they represented by counsel at the hearing. This is permissible under the rules only at the ex parte stage. At the conclusion of his judgment, paragraph 46, the judge said, quotes, It remains for me to thank counsel for the helpful assistance in this matter. Unquotes. Let us say that the helpful assistance of counsel resulted in the judge acceding to the application and giving leave. What then? Under the rules, the applicant lodges Form 86A and takes out his originating summons. These, the papers now must be served on the three companies because they are parties directly affected by the proceedings. Would the judge then go through the whole motion again, but this time with the three companies present as interested parties? Is there not something fundamentally wrong in the whole process? 
So far, I've been negative, telling you what ought not to be done. Let me at least strike a positive note. And my remarks are really addressed to the students and the audience. If there's one case which illustrates how real issues can properly be debated in court and how judgment on such issues can hover on a knife's edge, it would be the case of Wheeler against Leicester City Council. The issue broadly is this. Can a local authority lawfully deny the use of a sports ground to a rugby club because the club did not fully endorse the authority's policy against apartheid in South Africa? The Leicester City Council had a policy of discouraging sporting links with South Africa because of its practice of apartheid. The Leicester Football Club regularly used the council's sports grounds for its games. In August 1984, three of his members were selected to take part in an English rugby tour to South Africa. The council was unhappy about that and put questions to the club as to whether it would condemn the tour and press his players not to take part in the tour. The club responded by saying that it condemned apartheid, but there were differences of opinion over the way to deal with apartheid. It also told the council that it had given the three players a memo prepared by an anti-apartheid movement and asked them to seriously consider its contents before finally deciding to play in South Africa or not. The tour to South Africa duly took place in May and June 1984 and <coughs> the three <coughs> Leicester players participated. In August 1984, that's um, two months after the Games in uh, South Africa, the Council passed a resolution banning the club from using the sports ground for 12 months. Six members of the club, acting on their own behalf and on behalf of the other members, sought judicial review. It was refused by the judge ex parte, and the club members appealed. The Court of Appeal, by a majority, Lord Justice Brown Wilkinson dissenting, dismissed the appeal on the ground that the Council, when exercising its discretionary powers over the use of its sports grounds was entitled to have regard to the need to promote good race relations as expressed in section 71 of the Race Relations Act. And this is what section 71 says in neat three lines. It shall be the duty of every local authority to make appropriate arrangements with a view to securing that their various functions are carried out with due regard to the need to promote good relations between persons of different racial groups. Okay? It shall be the duty of every local authority to make appropriate arrangements with a view to securing that their various functions are carried out with due regard to the need to promote good relations between persons of different racial groups. The issue boiled down to this, as was argued and put in the Court of Appeal. Is Section 71 inward looking, requiring the authorities to maintain internally the standards laid down in the Act, or is it wider? So that when considering whether a club should use its sports grounds, it can lawfully have regard to the purpose expressed in Section 71. Holding that Section 71 is not simply inward-looking, the majority in the Court of Appeal came to the view that the Council took into account proper considerations in imposing the ban on the club. Lord Justice Brown Wilkinson took, looked at the matter more broadly. The case, he said, raised a conflict 
between two basic principles in a democratic society. The right of a democratically elected body to conduct their affairs in accordance with their own views, that is to say the Leicester City Council, and the right to freedom of conscience enjoyed by each individual in a democratic society. He concluded that, in effect, what the council was doing was to punish the club for having a view different from the councils for dealing with the issue of apartheid. And that, the, uh, Lord Justice Brown Wilkinson concluded, was unlawful. In the further appeal to the House of Lords by the club members, the appeal was allowed. The House came to this view. It was not simply whether Section 71 of the Act was inward-looking or not, accepting that the Council could have regard to the purpose expressed in the Act, the need to promote good relations between persons of different racial groups. The Council still had the duty to act fairly in entertaining the club's request to use the sports ground. The club was not acting in defiance of the council's views. It said that it too condemned apartheid, but different persons had different views as to how best to deal with the problem. What the council did in effect was to punish the club for not fully endorsing its own policy for dealing with apartheid, and this was unlawful. It acted beyond its powers. Now here, in a nutshell, is proper debate within the discipline of law. And the contrast with the two Hong Kong cases I referred to earlier could not be more stark and profound. And look at the efficient way the whole matter from first instance final appeal was dealt with. 27th September 1984, Mr. Justice Forbes refused ex parte leave. 27th September 1984. 10th October, appeal to the Court of Appeal lodged. February 1985, hearing in the Court of Appeal. March 1985, Court of Appeal judgments. 25th July 1985, final judgments from the House of Lords. <coughs> I now turn to an allied topic which uh, deals with constitutional challenges. It's still, of course, within the scope of judicial review. Order 53, Rule 1A, a rule of the High Court introduced in 2008, deals specifically with the lawfulness of an enactment. It is, I think, important to be precise with, with vocabulary and words such as striking down an enactment are often used. What does that mean? In my view, this is what it means. If an, enac an enactment is found to be inconsistent with some rights guaranteed in the Bill of Rights or the Basic Law, a tribunal of competent jurisdiction would give a declaratory judgment declaring that the enactment is inconsistent and to that extent deemed repealed. The executive arm of government respecting that declaration would then treat the enactment as no longer valid. Order 15, Rule 16 of the Rules of the High Court says that the High Court may make binding declarations of right whether or not any consequential relief is or could be claimed. So the question is, who can make binding declarations of right? As Mr. Justice Ribeiro in Secretary for Justice against Yao Yuk Lung, reported in 2007, said, quotes, a declaration that a statutory provision is unconstitutional is of the gravest import and generally calls for examination by the higher courts. I would go further. 
and say that this is within the exclusive jurisdiction of the higher courts, the high court and, of course, the Court of Final Appeal. Take the case of Secretary for Justice against Ocean Technology, one of the um, several citizen radio cases, where Ocean Technology was charged with offences under the Telecommunications Ordinance. Section 8 makes provisions for the grant of a license by the Chief Executive and Council, and Section 20 makes an offence to establish or maintain a means of telecommunication without a license. The defendant was acquitted by the magistrate who struck down Section 8 as being unconstitutional. The government's appeal to the judge of first instance was transferred to the Court of Appeal who allowed the appeal in a long and, I regret to say, convoluted judgment which somehow severed Section 20, the charging section, from Section 8 which requires a license to lawfully um, maintain means of telecommunication. That judgment, I regret to say, makes for wholly unconvincing reading. In my view, the solution to ocean technology is much simpler. The long title to the Magistrate's Ordinance, Chapter 227, is, quotes, to provide for the jurisdiction of magistrates and the procedure and practice before magistrates in relation to offences punishable on summary conviction. To provide for the jurisdiction of magistrates. A magistrate is entitled to amend the charge before him, section 27 of the ordinance, but he has no jurisdiction to strike down the enactment in the charge for being unconstitutional. This is because he has no power to make binding declarations. Nowhere in the magistrate's ordinance would one find such power. And the magistrate's courts, unlike the high court, has no inherent jurisdiction. If the defendant is convicted as charged and appeals, the matter goes to a high court judge, and there for the first time the defendant can make a constitutional challenge. Now, I'm aware that an English case, uh, the Director of Public Prosecutions against Hutchinson, which is quite a, again, quite a well-known case, some of you may be familiar with it, the case of the uh, Greenham Common Women, <coughs> Who were, who were protesting against the um, stationing of uh, nuclear uh, aircraft, uh, nuclear missiles and stuff uh, at or near Gr Greenham Common, um, where anti-nuclear campaigners successfully challenged the validity of the Greenham Common bylaws in the House of Lords, and the defence was raised first in a magistrate's court when they were brought before the magistrate on the charge. Now, I make no comment as to whether that was right or wrong. I go simply on the scheme of things in Hong Kong where plainly a magistrate's jurisdiction is confined within the four corners of the magistrate's ordinance. Now, I deal with um, something slightly controversial. Wensbury unreasonableness. <coughs> there is no translation of this term in the Hong Kong government glossary. That, I suggest, is because it's untranslatable. And yet, in most applications for judicial review, it is thrown in by counsel as a weapon of last resort. When all the other grounds of challenge fail, the government agency concerned is said to have acted with Winsbury unreasonableness. My suggestion is that it should be excised from use in Hong Kong. Many years ago, Lord Diplock attempted to formulate the proposition in the GCHQ case, um, Council of Civil Services against the Minister for Civil Service, in this way, and I think most lawyers would be very familiar with it and probably can rattle it off by heart. He says, <clears throat> quotes, 
By irrationality, I mean what can by now be succinctly referred to as Wensbury unreasonableness. Associated, associated provincial picture houses against Wensbury Corporation. It applies to a decision which is so outrageous in its defiance of logic or of accepted moral standards that no sensible person who had applied his mind to the question to be decided could have arrived at it. Whether a decision falls within this category is a question that judges by their training and experience should be well equipped to answer. This formulation has received growing criticism over the years, both from judges and from academic writers. Is it the role of judges to <laughs> express outrage? If such a stage of wrongdoing is reached, would the decision not simply be perverse and therefore well beyond the, the, the discretion conferred by statute? And, quotes, defiance of accepted moral standards. What does that mean? When have judges been given the jurisdiction to be judges of moral standards? Now, where a case succeeds on Bensbury unreasonableness, it must surely have satisfied at least one of the following criteria. One, acting outside the four corners of the statute. Two, failing to take into account a relevant consideration. Three, taking into account an irrelevant consideration. Four, adopting an improper purpose. But the vice of Wensbury unreasonableness as ground of attack in Hong Kong, and I emphasize that, goes much deeper. Take the Hong Kong Juhoi Macau Bridge case, Ju Yiwa, against Director of Envir Environmental Protection, 2011. Uh, incidentally, would you kindly help me by putting up your hands, any of you who has actually read the judgments in, in the bridge case? One, two, three. Right. Thank you. Where the applicant took the Director of Environmental Protection on Judicial Review, alleging that her approval of the Environmental Impact Assessment Report was vitiated by illegality, and the last ground of a complaint inevitably in her Form 86 application was Wensbury unreasonableness. Now, there, there were many other grounds, for those of you who have read the, read the judgment, uh, uh, including, including um, perfectly valid environmental concerns, such as whether, for example, the report sub submitted to the Director of Environmental Protection adequately dealt with the uh, level of sulfur dioxide, of ozone, of fine particulates, of toxins in the air uh, at the time of the assessment, which was chosen as the year 2031. Now, those were all dealt with by the judge and dismissed. Uh, I shall now go to the one ground on which the applicant succeeded, but, but uh, I will be talking about that on a different occasion. But I focus on simply the, the last, last cry, desperate cry of a failing application, which is the so-called Wensbury unreasonableness ground. Now, what precisely, what precisely hides behind this untranslatable legal jargon? Is the applicant saying that the director's decision was irrational or perverse? If so, it becomes a very serious matter. If established, would the director be dismissed or required to resign? Can a director keep her job if she acted irrationally, perversely, in such an important matter 
as the construction of this massive bridge. The lack of discipline in the law permits counsel to bandy about legal jargon without having to seriously apply their minds as to what they are really saying. Are such accusations made with no consequence to the person accused? Can failure to make good such an accusation simply be shrugged off with a smile? Is litigation just a game of words in the courts with no impact outside? Laying Winsbury and his reasonableness to, test, to rest would, I, in my view, in no way inhibit the proper application for judicial review in Hong Kong. <clears throat> but my reasons for the proposal goes even deeper. The judiciary is an arm of government. Government action in Hong Kong is exercised over a population predominantly Chinese-speaking. Proceedings in public law are, by definition, in the public field. It must follow that the courts in action in that field must use their best endeavor to cut out mumbo-jumbo, sweep away obscurities so that their statements are readily understood. If expressed in English, as they are invariably in the higher courts, easily translated into Chinese. Access to justice is a fundamental common law right. It does not simply mean the right to initiate proceedings in the courts. It mandates engagement in the process all the way to judgment. To the ordinary citizen of Hong Kong, for there to be no attempt by lawyers and judges to make the system as transparent as possible is a denial of a fundamental common law right. I suggest that for the long-term survival of the common law in Hong Kong, this is an absolute imperative. I've exceeded my time, but I thank you for your patience. Thank you very much, Henry. Um, <clears throat> now we have 15 minutes, 20 minutes. We can afford to keep the lights on for a few more minutes. Um, so please ask your questions. Uh, I think you'll find your microphones are on if you press the button in front of you. Who's going to start us off? Okay, I'll start us off then. <laughs> Are you going to go, Johannes? I don't want to preempt you. But um, I, I'm still pondering about um, what Mr. Justice Litton said about the Secretary for Justice and Ocean Terminal case. Uh, because on your argument, then that means compatibility of the Bill of Rights will be outside the jurisdictions of all magistrate courts. Um, suppose I formulate it in a different way. A person could only be convicted of an offence which is known to law. A magistrate must have jurisdiction to decide whether an offence exists in the first place. And if the statute which creates the offence is unconstitutional because it violates the Bill of Rights, then there is no offence known to law. Now, from that argument, therefore, whether an offence exists in law because the creating statute is inconsistent with Bill of Rights will fall within the jurisdictions of the magistrate court. I, I accept that uh, the magistrate court may not have jurisdictions to grant a declaration, but that is a very different issue from whether a magistrate will have jurisdiction to decide whether a particular statute is inconsistent with the Bill of Rights. And particularly when we, the Bill of Rights, if I remember correctly, when we draft the Bill of Rights, the issues has been discussed whether 
inconsistency with the Bill of Rights should be decided exclusively at the High Court or it should be decided by any court uh, in the course of the proceedings. And the legislature eventually decide that it should not be exclusively in the High Court just to avoid a situation, therefore, if someone raises a question of the Bill of Rights, whether it's in consistence with the statute in a criminal case in a magistrate, the magistrate will have to refer the matter. Uh, rather than one way, of course, is the magistrate say that it is not within my jurisdiction, I'll decide and let you appeal. But then the more likely situation will be the party will ask for a German or referral of the matter to the High Court. But that would be rather unruly and that would, as a result, uh, um, delay a lot of criminal process. So the legislature did make a choice to allow all courts to deal with the consistency with the Bill of Rights so that matters could proceed and then we deal with that. So from that point of view, um, would it be right therefore to say that technically a magistrate will have no power to grant declaration but nonetheless it will still have the jurisdiction to determine whether the criminal offence creating or the statute creating a criminal offence is consistent with the Bill of Rights? Now you began your analysis upon the supposition that the situation facing the magistrate is that the section in the charge is a nullity. Is a nullity. Well, I was recently spanked by the Court of Final Appeal for suggesting that is so. It's not a nullity. Now, when you when you um, are dealing with the constitu constitutionality of an enactment, you are undergoing really a, a process, are you not, of measuring that enactment against the demands of the Bill of Rights, the ICCPR, the um, basic law, and the fundamental rights and freedoms guaranteed therein. You, so your jurisdiction is no longer now dealing with offences uh, punishable by uh, on summary conviction. You're now dealing with a, a process of measuring the, if you like, the value of the enactment against the criteria uh, entrenched internationally, if you like. Now, ask yourself this, wherein, where, where, wherein is this process um, dealt with in the magistr magistrate's ordinance? Uh, this is a court of limited jurisdiction. It, it's meant to, do, to deal with cases summarily. And if something more serious, then okay, uh, you, 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 then it go, goes to, to the High Court. So I, I, I would respectfully suggest that um, if one simply confine the analysis within the four corners of, of this, the statute itself, there's really no room for, for such argument. Whether, whether it's better or worse, well, I'm not sure, because how many magistracies are there in Hong Kong? Um, and you may have the same charge being dealt with in, in Chin Wun, in, in Chin Wan, in, in Tun Mun, in, in Central, in Western. Now, uh, one, one uh, magistrate would declare it consistent, another magistrate would declare it not, a third magistrate would read it down and, and, uh, and amend to make it consistent. That would surely c create chaos, isn't it, in the administration of justice in the magistrate's courts? Anybody Hi. like to join in? Hello. Yes, yes. hello. Yeah. Um, Perhaps you'd like to tell us who you are when you... Sorry, that was Professor Johannes Chan. Yeah, I know him. You he probably don't know famous, him at all, but I he's a him, yeah. very low profile. 
Uh, I'm a student here, but not from uh, Faculty of Law, but I'm very interested in most of the law topics because, you know, we are interacting with law day by day. I would like to know the term when spurry unreasonable, unreasonableness, right? This is the term. Is it only applied within a court decision or universal? For example, like um, the police decision. Now, you know, there are many, many uh, Occupy Central recently. For example, I'll give you a specific case. A kid who is under 18 was charged with uh, wasting police effort. The case is that this kid uh, uh, got a scam from somebody to steal his um, uh, uh, visa card. But because he because he he was very worried about about um, uh, somebody uh, damages incurred on him, and he called the police and then uh, lied to police that he lost his mastercard. But after the police came, spending about forty five minutes with the kid, and he discovered that this that kid lied to him, and he charged the kid with. Uh, uh, wasting police efforts. So, uh, does this apply to uh, if the kid applied for judicial review against the police decision when it's very unreasonable in making the charge? Would this apply to other sectors as well besides the court decision, I mean the judge decision? Thank you. Well, I think I think you've made my case. Um, the the origin of this expression goes back to a case decided in England shortly after the uh, Second World War, and uh, it concerns um, a um, directive issued by the. Wensbury Corporation, the local authority, to the, as they were called, the picture houses in the area, to say that um, on Sunday, um, no children under the age of uh, 15 should be allowed to watch films, full stop. And uh, the cinemas were uh, unhappy with that directive, and uh, took out proceedings for a declaration that it was unlawful. There was, no, there was no judicial review proceedings in those days. The term had not yet been invented. And the court dealt with it, really, very, very, very summarily. And uh, basically to say, well, it's well within the jurisdiction of the corporation. Uh, uh, you, you simply look at, um, say, the... Um, I think the Sunday Entertainment Act uh, and also the Cinematographic um, something Act. If you look at the two statutes, you'd see that broadly the discretion of uh, the corporation to control the use of picture houses is very wide and would include a directive to the effect that um, children under the age of 15 accompanied by parents or not, were not allowed in the cinema. And just to, to sort of boost, I think, the strength of the, the argument, Lord Green then uh, quoted another judge, actually. It wasn't his, his own phrase. Another judge, I think Mr. Justice Waller, I think, in a different case, <coughs> to say, well, I suppose if a corporation were in control of schools, were to ban or to dismiss a school teacher, a red-headed school teacher, because she had red hair, well then that would be uh, unreasonable and, and unlawful. Now, it is this throwaway phrase that lawyers then caught on to, to coin the phrase Wensbury unreasonableness. It, it, it's it's, it's a very fluid um, uh, criterion to judge 
legality at the time when really the uh, discipline of, um, of law regarding judicial review had not really coagulated. In, in, it was very early days. But, but now, I mean, when you have a, a range of grounds on which you can um, impeach uh, the authorities, the most important is, well, within, is it within the, the powers conferred by statute? Uh, has it taken into account irrelevant considerations? Has it taken into account relevant considerations? Are these powers used for some improper purpose? Now, once you've got that range of grounds, then you don't need something as vague and imprecise as so-called Wensbury unreasonableness, which, as I said, cannot be translated into Chinese. And isn't that good enough reason why it should not be used in Hong Kong when 80% of the people don't use English? Yes, please. And then Eric. I yield to no one in my admiration and respect for Henry, but uh, I might be permitted to disagree one, on one or two points. Firstly, I speak almost no Chinese, but I refuse to accept that there is no concept of reasonableness in Chinese people or in China or in Hong Kong. They know what reasonableness means, no less than I do, I'm sure. <laughs> and reasonableness is a fundamental concept in the exercise of powers conferred by statute and by basic law. And so I think that, um, with respect, Henry, I can't agree to your four-legged formula because it ignores what reasonableness may be in a particular circumstance outside your four categories. I, I, I ask you this. Lord Diplock's out-of-date categorization that the courts have now cast aside, but which I know you, you're fond of, includes something called irrationality. And the courts have gone on to look at what irrationality means, really, and to put it in modern simple to understand English and I know that it's been translated to Chinese too do you reject the extra categorization Henry of when a decision just doesn't add up when it's illogical because that's what irrationality is said now to mean in the public law sense <coughs> and is that not <coughs> a, a fundamental requirement on a decision maker to reach a decision based on what is in front of him and to do so, your four categories don't take this into account, the process of decision making, he has to act logically and therefore reasonably. His decision making must add up. There's nothing about arbitrariness in your four categories either. The, the rules are, are critical to protect the citizen against arbitrary decision making. After all, those who drafted and gave us our basic law, which is the source of judicial review in Hong Kong these days, Articles 18 and 35 make that very clear. There's a specific right in the basic law to challenge government through the courts, which have the exclusive jurisdiction under the other articles of the basic law to make those distinctions. These are fundamental areas which guarantee our judicial review jurisdiction they stand above if, if section 21k6 was perhaps to be found an unreasonable restriction or not, in, not consistent we would still have under the basic law a law for judicial review in Hong Kong constitutionally so it's that important isn't it and not only is it that important it has to be administrative power has to be exercised reasonably and logically, and not in an arbitrary fashion. Uh, the Vice President, yes, I've been buzzed, Johnson Lamb says there's such a thing as it enhanced Wensbury, his native language. He starts with Chinese. If he knows what it means, and the courts know what it means, and it's expressed in that way, isn't it something approaching heresy to say that Wensbury doesn't mean anything and should therefore be abandoned in, in face of a, what I might respectfully describe as a redactive formula. 
Yeah, actually, uh, thanks for uh, this question. Exactly. No, I, I think let, let, the, uh, uh, yeah. let Mr. Justice let answer that question, please. I think it would, it would shock Nigel Catt if I were to say I agree with him. <laughs> I, I have no difficulty whatever with irrationality, with perversity, with even unreasonableness. If, 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 that, if that is what is alleged, then let the facts be shown to match the words. But how do you assemble a group of facts which m matches Wensbury unreasonableness? I mean, that's, that's my problem. If you mean perversity, say it. The next hand up was Eric and then Margaret. Eric. I just want to follow up with uh, Johannes' uh, uh, line of questions. Um, of course, I understand the uh, downside of allowing different magistracies to deal with a constitutional issue, the recent chaos. But does it go back to what Johannes has mentioned about the choice of legislature when enacting the Bill of Rights at that time in not uh, creating a constitutional court or restricting all this decision to a particular court? In particular, the way the Bill of Rights ordinance uh, uh, sets out the effect of the Bill of Rights is that all other ordinances need to be interpreted uh, as far as possible, consistent with the Bill of Rights, and in so it's not possible then to be uh, declared inconsistent, etc. So once we have this effect of the Bill of Rights, then it seems to me that even we don't allow matters to go that far to strike out the, um, uh, um, <coughs> the offence, the magistrate is still tasked with an interpretative uh, 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 role. For example, if a particular offence with some burden, uh, 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 shifting of burden of proof, uh, 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 um, uh, um, provision, etc., or how to interpret the scope of a particular offence, what act constitutes offence, the magistrate still need to refer to the Bill of Rights and then interpret the two together and see what that offence means, whether that can be consistent with the Bill of Rights, uh, 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 um, a lot, even adopting the literal meaning or, or, or the language of that uh, statute, <coughs> or if the magistrate cannot so reconcile the two, the hand, the Bill of Rights order mandates the magistrate to say that uh, 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 that offence uh, cannot take effect. So, given this choice of legislature at the time, it seems to me that uh, it's very difficult to argue that the magistrate cannot deal with constitutional issue when the offence is brought before it. I think that's the, my query. I don't think I, there's anything I, I need to add. Um, It presupposes, it presupposes that the magistrate has jurisdiction. Yes, if the magistrate has jurisdiction, he would deal with it in the way you, you suggested. But the, the, the very proposition I'm putting forward is that the magistrate does not have the jurisdiction. So he deals with the charge as he sees it. And if at the end of the day, he finds the defendant guilty as charge, either as charge or amended. He's got power under Section 27 to amend and then put the matter to the defendant again <coughs> and perhaps <coughs> to convict on the amended charge. Well, then the matter goes on appeal, if, if it goes on appeal, where for the first time there's jurisdiction. It's to me, it's as simple as that. Now, I, I'm going to uh, bring the guillotine <coughs> down at 20 past, so Margaret. Thank you. Uh, Professor Lytton, uh, I quite understand that you don't like the word, the phrase, Wensbury unreasonable. Uh, and in fact, it is not just a matter of Chinese, because we have uh, Christopher Forsyth here not so long ago, and he told us the trouble 
the English courts and the English uh, uh, writers have with Wensbury unreasonableness. Uh, but I don't think that uh, it's being uh, untranslatable into Chinese ought to be a legitimate reason because there are many things in the legal language that we cannot readily translate into Chinese. And very often, the courts themselves uh, do not <coughs> like to use Wensbury unreasonableness. They rather say, so uh, unreasonableness in a, 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 an administrative law sense. And then they go into the long hand of explaining what it is. And so that when we explain judicial review and what are the grounds of judicial review to the local Chinese speakers, we use the long hand. We explain that it is not just because you find the decision of the chief executive or whatever public authority <laughs> unreasonable in the sense that you do not agree that it is reasonable. That is not a, a good ground for judicial review. We explain in the long hand. And I don't think that as far as I'm concerned, I have not encountered any particular difficulty in doing so. Rather, my difficulty is with words and phrases which are very readily translatable into Chinese but is totally misleading, like judicial review. If there is a ground for excising that phrase, the first expression which ought to go is judicial review <laughs> because the public loves it. Uh, and I see that you are very impressed with the lady who asked that question on Wednesday and reasonableness. Um, and that shows you how far, how, how deeply the Hong Kong public had, um, had uh, taken possession of judicial review. Because in Chinese, si fat fok hat, it's wonderful. You know, you powerful executive, but the judiciary can... Uh, can review what you are doing and, and take you to task and, and say that you are wrong. So, so I don't think that that, that ought to uh, deter us from using Wensbury, the term, if it is the term <coughs> that we are cons concerned with. Rather, it seems to me that the, 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 the resort to judicial review so readily by the public tells you something about the political system in Hong Kong why people have to resort to judicial review so often. And then it is a question of explaining to the public. Because if in the course of explanation, you actually may help the public to understand more what is the foundation of the rule of law. So the phrases which are not readily translatable or readily translatable, uh, which may be misleading, it allows you to fantasize and to romanticize. Uh, these phrases may well be a good starting point for us to explain. W would you not agree that this is a job that anyone who's trained in a bit of law ought to do uh, with greater care and to the benefit of the public? Well, I, I agree to this extent that it's not a very comfortable place for anyone to stand too high and if the executive stands tall and imposing then the, the public would like to have that cut down by means such as judicial review who administers then this jurisdiction are the judges then going to stand even higher than the executives who stand too high and have to be cut down and when the judges stand higher than those executives, what then happens to the judges? Yeah. Briefly follow up. That in, in fact, the problem we ha I mean, I, I do a little bit of explain, explaining to the, 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 the public uh, what the rule of law judicial review means in, in the working condition. That's, in fact, the thing which worries me most that when one high power is, to the view of the public, not functioning in a fair and just manner, they seek a higher authority 
instead of the origin of judicial review, which is really based on the separation of power, of the limitation of law, that no, no one should exceed legal authority and so on. That, in fact, is a, a very deep problem. But I'm afraid that problem cannot be solved simply by cutting out certain expressions. Well, that's why I say that... Um, Judges have to be extremely careful in the exercise of this jurisdiction. Have to be extremely disciplined in the use of this instrument to cut it down on the overweened executive branch. Because if it's not properly administered, then sooner or later the judges would be seen to be stand, standing too tall. And then who is going to cut those judges down. Now I want finally to abuse my powers by <coughs> we have with us here the Solicitor General who is presumably the object of more judicial reviews than anybody else in Hong Kong. So may I just ask the uh, almost the official defendant or the respondent I should say on this one. Any comment Wesley? Um. <coughs> <laughs> You'll never come to Hong Kong you again, no, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> not, not when it's chaired by uh, Professor Wilkinson. Um, I, I do have a question, and um, uh, no, rather have a question. Uh, um, In, re in respect of the um, power of the magistrate, so to speak, in, in, a, in a case where the constitutionality of a um, piece of legislation is being impugned, would it not be, because that is, especially in the case of Yao Yop Lung, um, in that event, I can never resolve myself as a matter of jurisprudence how could a case be then taken by way of an appeal, by way of case stated, when if the magistrate is to follow the decision of the higher, the superior court decision of Yao Yop Lun, um, <coughs> to just adjourn the case, which means there is no verdict, which means there is no final determination, mm. how can an appeal ever be lodged? To a, to a higher court when there is no final determination. <coughs> There's something that, that doesn't, I don't think, fit well with the rest of the Well, that, that's why we I know. suggest that normally in life the simplest solution is also the best. And if the magistrate was simply to deal with the charge as he sees it and deal with the facts surrounding the charge, makes his findings of fact, give his determination one way or the other, if um, it's acquittal, well then I suppose the constitutionality of that provision will have to await another uh, occasion. If it's conviction, well, of course, the um, defendant may choose not to appeal, and that would also be the end of the matter. But if he does choose to appeal, why then the constitutionality issue would then be resolved in the High Court. Really, it's as simple as that. And that seconds. seems to me to be what the, statute, the statutory scheme suggests. But isn't there a problem with that, Henry? Because you don't have jurisdiction to try a charge that's not lawful. This is presupposing. And it's a preliminary question. And that's this, is what presupposing, the this is presupposing that, that the, uh, the enactment on which the charge is based is a nullity. He has to decide that first. Well, my, my, my simple proposition is that he has no jurisdiction to so decide. Full stop. Okay. Presumption of innocence. Uh, Lee Kong Kut, Xin Yao Ming, they all start from magistrates. 
uh, and they all start from magistrate deciding certain reverse onus provisions uh, in the law is inconsistent with the Bill of Rights. Uh, yes, at some stage there were some confusions because every court is dealing with that issues. The, the issues was quickly settled uh, after the Court of Appeal and then later uh, the Privy Council has settled. So the, the problems about different magistrates deciding differently may not necessarily arise. Uh, we have seen that. Uh, on the other hand, um, it seems that, uh, if I recall correctly, the Bill of Rights itself, I think it's Section 6, specifically provides that um, no court uh, or, or no proceedings will be outside the jurisdictions of any court because it deals with Bill of Rights. Uh, and that might provide the jurisdictions for the magistrate to decide uh, from the Bill of Rights ordinance itself rather than from the magistrate ordinance. Okay, well, we're, we're losing our ordinance, <coughs> audience, not ordinance, sorry. But thank you very much. Audience, you've been great. You've been fantastic. And Henry, without you, we wouldn't have an audience that's fantastic. So thank you so much for, as professor in the law faculty. Honorary. Unpaid. <laughs> <laughs> this lecture. Have a nice evening, everybody.